You're listening to the Wedding Biz Network, the voice of the creative entrepreneur. Hey, everybody, it's Andy Kushner with The Wedding Biz, a podcast that provides both education and inspiration for those of us in or interested in the weddings and event industry. If you missed last week's episode, it was a very special interview with photographer Paul Morse with Paul Morse Studios based in New Orleans. And today's guest is my friend Jennifer Stein, co-founder and editor-in-chief of Destination I Do magazine, which can be found on newsstands in all 50 states and 12 countries. You can also find it online with a daily blog and her own podcast. Jennifer has over 20 years of business and publishing experience and was recognized as one of the top 35 entrepreneurs under 35 by Arizona Republic. She also consults and custom publishes. Enjoy this conversation with Jennifer Stein. So, hey, Jen, oh my God, it's been too long. I am so happy to have you on again. I miss talking to you. Hey, Andy, it's so good to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, of course. So I, there's so many things I want to talk about with you, Jennifer, I, you know, given your, your position, you know, with the publication and, and, you know, your expertise in the industry. So I, I really want to dive into some of these questions and issues like this, you know, now that we we seem to be coming out of the COVID era, I mean, who knows, right, with all the variants and everything, but right now it, it seems to be down. They've take, They've gotten rid of the mask mandate and how do you look back on these past two years at this point? Oh, it's like looking at a car accident. Like it happened so slowly, but also so fast that it's like a blur. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. Like it's, it, I don't know if you've ever been in a car accident, but that's exactly what it feels like. Like as it's happening, it feels so slow right? and like you kind of can't even get your thoughts in order and you're reacting and you're in, you know, it, and it, it's almost like quiet in a way. And then when you look back on it, it feels like it just went by like snap of fingers. You yeah, know? And yet two full years, crazy. Two full years. I mean, here we are basically almost to the day of the anniversary of like when everything kind of shut down really, or when it started to. That's right. It just about, cause this is uh, for people listening right now, we're recording March 16th. So it is. Well, do you feel, you know, before we look at the business part of it, I mean, do you feel, Jen, like you've changed personally in any ways as a result of this whole experience? I think I've changed so many ways. I think I've changed the way I look at time spent. Like I look at my time so differently. Before it was like this constant frenetic pace of personal obligations, business obligations, I had no transition time and I don't know if you can relate to this, but I don't go into an office. And so I transition my role from being business owner to mom, to wife, to friend, to daughter with absolutely no, like there's no pause, right? When you go into an office, you can change your role from husband, father while you're doing the commute. Well, while you're driving. Yeah. While you're driving, you're, you're literally putting putting a different hat on, right? I don't have that ability because I work from home. And so I can go from business owner to mom to wife within seconds. Sometimes I'm doing the same, you know, two things at the same time. And so I've really learned to, when I am out of the office, I am out of the office. Like I really put my phone down and I focus entirely on my children. And when, and we've implemented rules, we've had to, because I don't know if, I don't think you experienced this, but we had our kids at home while we're working in there at school. I don't know how, yeah, my, my daughter was, is, has been out of the house. And so, you know, I was lucky in that sense. It didn't affect me that way. Well, and I know a lot of people who listen to your podcast did experience that. And so all of us, I think have a little PTSD. I myself definitely do. And, you know, we've now implemented things about like when my kids just would barge into my office while I'm in the middle of writing a story or trying to collect my thoughts or, you know, working with my accounting team or whatever. And so now we've like implemented different things so that it's not just me going from one role to another in a split second that I, you know, everyone respects each other's space a little bit more. Everyone's respect, more respectful for time. And so that's one major way I feel like I've changed and I'm less 
apt to say yes to things. Like I really, really weigh, how is this going to impact this, 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 and this if I say yes? Before I just say yes, I was just like, I wanted to be part of all the things. And I think my FOMO is not non-existent. I used to have it. I used to really struggle with that. If I was like, there was an engage happening that I couldn't be at, or if there was, you know, a, a group of friends going out and I wasn't able to, to go, I still miss. And I'm like, oh man, I wish I was there, but I don't have that same level of FOMO that I used to have because I just realized there is, there's other things that sometimes take priority and I need to focus entirely on that instead of trying to split myself 20 different ways. Yeah. I hear you talking about really setting boundaries and, and, you know, I've always been pretty good at setting boundaries, but I agree. I mean, this has helped me to really, uh, kind of refocus and think about what are my priorities and, and through this experience, you know, relationships, friendships, my relationship with my now wife, you know, my brother, my daughter, my mother, all of that friends, is even more precious, like it already was, but even more precious now. And so I'm hardcore about my boundaries too. No question about that. Yeah. And I think that's a good place to be. Like, I don't think it's bad to put healthy boundaries in place. And I think I had them by and large. I did have them before, but I think there were these little nuances that life of COVID and being homebound 24 hours a day, seven days a week for, you know, not quite two years. Cause I did do some travel in between and I did attend events and engage and, and whatnot, which let me just tell you, that's the other thing. When I would go to those things, when I would travel, when I would attend engage in the last two years, my appreciation, like from a soul deep level was so much greater. Like I just, I, kind of to be a little cheesy and cliche, like I felt like I did a better job and have done a better job of smelling the roses. Mm, Yeah. I think we've all been affected that way. What about your perspective on your business? You know, before we get into specifics about travel, international travel, domestic travel, I mean, all of that stuff, what just your perspective overall on your business. Can you talk about that? I think I saw some things that maybe I had my blinders on to before. Um, Being in the media space is kind of a tricky area because people always want something from you. And, you know, I always hear things about, you know, small businesses, you know, support small businesses. Well, in the media space, I'm kind of an anomaly. And I know there are other publishers out there like Wedlux and Love Inc. and, you know, Southern Bride that are family owned and operated or, you know, one female entrepreneur owns it. But I'm in a sea of, you know, major conglomerate media outlets, right? Right, And I think one of the things that was really, really interesting to me was people still wanted to be published and they wanted that, you know, notoriety and they wanted to be a part of Destination I Do, which is something that I absolutely love. But when it came time to support small business from a marketing standpoint, those marketing dollars would just kind of go to Facebook ads or Google AdWords or, you know, larger, major mega companies, you know, (laughs) dare I say monopolies. And that is, that's been a little tough for me to wrap my mind around. And so you know, I've never, we've never been a pay for play publication ever. We still, we still won't be, but it's also made me kind of look at the, the companies and even, even visitors bureaus and hotels that are constantly asking us to promote them, promote them, promote them. But then there's, there's very little reciprocal support there. And so that, that was something that I kind of struggled with a little bit because we did a lot to really promote people, even when advertising dollars were non-existent. Um, and, you know, we're still trying to keep things going. And we did a, we really made a consorted effort to say, all right, let's make sure that we are not, we're not promoting ourselves and, and trying to get people to spend the marketing dollars they don't have. It's more important that their staff stays on than it is for them to spend money with us. Right. And so we did a lot to really promote and help as much as we could without charging anything. 
And then when things started to kind of come back around again, that's when it was like, okay, there was some that were like, they were like, hey, we saw that you supported us and we are absolutely going to, you know, even if it's a small buy-in compared to what we used to do, we're back. And we, when we see the value, we see the partnership that you provided to us in a challenging time. And we're going to give, we're going to, you know, make sure we support you in return. And then there were people that didn't, then there were companies that didn't. And so that was, that was a little eye opening, and it kind of changed, I think the way that I look at things a little bit. Um, And then I would also say, and this is something that I've always really, I've always felt really passionate about is I'm not a reactionary business owner. I don't, if something happens, negative or positive, I don't just jump on the bandwagon or make a knee-jerk reaction ever, 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 ever. I sit in the space. I try and kind of think through if I do this, what would happen? If I do this, what would happen? What are my options? What makes the most sense for my company, for the industry at large? You know, those kinds of things. I really, really think through it. I talk to people that I have confidence in, that I know they're wise. I know they have good counsel. Those are things that I've always done. And I feel like the last two years, it it couldn't be more important to be responsive versus reactive. Does that make sense? That's such a good point. Yeah. Well, not being so impulsive and, and really just taking a breath and really thinking it through. And, and it's, you know, as busy as now we all are again, it's hard to do that. Yes, it is hard to do that. It's really hard to do that because I feel like we're just getting inundated oh, by yeah. different problems. And I, like the thing, the, the, the analogy that comes to mind is I feel like we're all just a little bit of like, like a raw nerve. Well, I, you know what you talked <laughs> about, right? Well, before we hit the record button, we're, you know, there is definitely PTSD. No yes. question about it going on with this. And yeah, I think we're all still raw, vulnerable, you know, and, and, not necessarily anxious, but I think just a little bit on edge, like what might be next or it's, 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 yeah. And then not to mention, I mean, I think you both, we're both on the same page, uh, the political situation prior to Biden coming in, everything was just oh so wacky. Yeah. I, I, it was, I was already, I already had five, four or five years of PTSD just during that. And then you, <laughs> then, then this COVID issue. And so, well, so let's dig into to, to, uh, today and how you see, uh, first of all, I want to kind of talk about international travel, but first domestic destination weddings. How are they going? How are they doing now? How, how is that going? Better than ever. And I, I kind of predicted this when I kind of saw what was happening, maybe midway through the pandemic. I was like, okay, this is my prediction. And my prediction was people are going to be sick to death of their own zip code. Right. They are going to be like, I am tired of my house. Like now they, everyone spent a ton of money on, you know, beautifying their home. And I mean, we ordered sofas and it's taken almost a year to get them. Yeah, like supply issues, yeah. supply issues. But then also the demand was really high at the start of all this. And so, you know, there's a lot of different things at play, but people, I, I was like, I'm anticipating people getting tired of their own zip code and really wanting to get out and travel. But I don't know because of international travel being a little tricky, you have to have a negative COVID test to come back to the U S there's a lot of different, you know, restrictions in different areas, things change constantly. And so people with international travel kind of, I was like, they're going to get a little, you know, not standoffish, but, but maybe a little fearful around it just because there's a lot of unknowns. And I was like, I think people are going to get in their cars and they're going to drive to their destination wedding. I think they're, these drive market destination weddings are going to be huge in the next, and already in just a short period of time, we've, we've actually seen domestic destination weddings go up by about 10%. Wow. In just the past, you know, nine months, 10 months. So that's, that's really, really huge. And so the, the companies and the, the venues that are doing it right, and they're, you know, doing it safely and they're working with their couples and, and, you know, they're making sure that things are going as smoothly as possible, despite things like staffing issues. And, you know, there's a whole litany of problems that 
pretty much everybody's facing. The ones that have done it really smart and and they've they've made they've looked at their property. Let's let's use venues for example. Instead of using just their ballroom, if they're going around their property and saying, "Well, how can we maybe reuse this space over here for an intimate ceremony or an intimate dinner party reception?" You know, instead of just going ballroom, 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 because ballrooms typically bring in a lot of revenue, but so do these other little, you know, kitschy spaces that people were needing. And so the ones that did did it right and really looked at the client and said, okay, intimate weddings are what we're dealing with, you know, for the next bit of time. Let's make sure that we've got, you know, the right kind of spaces for them. We can accommodate their needs. We're not just forcing them into a ballroom situation that doesn't necessarily work or is safe. Those are the places that I think really did it right. And the ones that were just like, couldn't get out of their own way and, and couldn't figure out how to really accommodate the needs of the destination couple quickly. Those were ones that really, they're, they're still on the struggle bus a little bit. Yeah. I want to be sure you know the wonderful news of our latest show, Stop and Smell the Roses, with acclaimed lifestyle and event design expert, Preston Bailey. Not only will he share the secrets, tools, and technologies behind his extraordinary ability to create a theatrical environment out of any space, you will also discover more about the man behind the magic. Preston will reveal how his focus on personal growth has been the root of his professional success, and you'll have the opportunity for him to answer your questions along the way. Plus, Preston will be inviting onto the show many of the star celebrities he has worked with in the past, so you don't want to miss a single episode. We also have another great show on the Wedding Biz Network, The Business of Being Creative, with host Sean Lowe. Since debuting, his show has really taken off, and he's continuing to bring you the creative business advice he's shared with accomplished industry notables. Be sure to take advantage of Sean's talkback opportunity by recording questions and comments from right there in each episode's show notes. So, if you are a creative who is turning your craft into a business or want to take it to another level, head to theweddingbiznetwork.com and take a listen to Stop and Smell the Roses with Preston Bailey and The Business of Being Creative with Sean Lowe. That's theweddingbiznetwork.com. You were talking about supply issues, even with just getting a sofa. What are the struggles uh, that you're seeing in the wedding industry as a whole around that kind of issue? Like I'm hearing, I'm not as privy to it personally, but I'm hearing there are staff shortages still and we got price issues. And I mean, what are you seeing with all of that? <laughs> and and how fun for everyone, because this is like the biggest year for weddings, right? So uh-huh. not only are we coming off a pandemic, like I feel like everyone, and this is so understandable, like the exhaustion that we all feel collectively and the I feel like it's okay to talk about and not just run out and be like, yay, we're back. Like, but there's, there's challenges to being back. And part of that is the staffing issues. Like you go to a restaurant and like I, myself, when I go to a restaurant, I think I am, it's the service. I'm expecting the service to be slower. I'm expecting menu items to not be available. They may not have mint for my mojito, or they may not have whatever, they ran out of a specific type of meat or whatever, I'm expecting there to be issues at every level. I'm expecting to look around and seeing tables that are not bust or no one there to bust them. And I expect that, right? So when I go into a restaurant, instead of like getting disappointed with the service or frustrated with it, I think to myself, I am sitting in a restaurant not in my own home. Someone else is bringing me food that I don't have to clean up. Right. I didn't have to cook it. Right. How happy am I right now? I'm with my loved ones enjoying a glass of wine that, yeah, maybe it took 25 minutes to get it, but who cares? I'm here. I'm out of my, you know, and and just being appreciative to the people who are showing up is huge. But when it comes to these venues and the staffing shortages, it is a real, real situation and everyone's facing it. It is really by and large, it's happening to everyone. And I think that is, that's a challenge. And I, I honestly don't know what the solution is to it. I really don't because, you know, I think part of it is people that, you know, the servers, the catering staff, the the kitchen staff, if there's less of those individuals, and then at the top, there's a, you know, a wedding coordinator, maybe there used to be three. Now there's one. And that one person is handling all of the events and there's more of them. 
So I feel like we all just need to maybe do a little bit of education to the couple because I think there's this pent up demand. There's these people that are like, I was so excited to get engaged and we waited because we didn't want to be in the middle of COVID and have to wait. But now we, all those other postponed rescheduled events are, have taken the dates and now we have to wait and they're frustrated. Like, I think just educating people as to why may help. I don't know. I mean, I know it's good to shield our clients from the mayhem and that's what they pay us for. But I also think setting expectations is more important than ever before. And really, if if it does take a little bit of education and and not shielding them from every little thing, it may be helpful on the back end of getting some of that, you know, the backlash from these clients. Because I'm talk to a lot of wedding planners, a lot of photographers, and and I'm hearing the same things over and over where these clients are just frustrated and overwhelmed and not understanding the problems that wedding planners and venues and everybody else is facing. And Stephanie Kane did an amazing article for the New York Times about the floral shortage. And I would recommend anybody listening to read it because it was really well done. It explains a lot. And I think there's just different shortages or different examples explaining the shortages across the board, Um, different news articles you can read. You know, I'm definitely not the expert on supply chain, so (laughs) I'm not going to pretend that I am. I've listened to tons of podcasts about it. I've listened to, you know, different experts talk about it and read different articles and whatnot. And, And there's explanation to it, which I think helps people understand where the blame lies, which is kind of all over the place. Um, and largely with COVID, quite honestly. And, you know, I think, I think it's just good to be educated ourselves to what's really happening, adjust our expectations, and then adjust the expectations of our clients so that they understand what's possible and what's not possible. Yeah, no, I completely agree with everything you're saying. I mean, that's really important rather than just not say anything. And I, I think to reset their expectations is is really critical and hopefully they'll be understanding uh, you know hopefully you know also i want to come back for a minute to international travel i mean it's like i had an experience myself so i uh i produced the music for a, a destination wedding back in november it was in at amanera beautiful place in the dominican republic and oh, it was gorgeous property. yeah and it was this famous brazilian model daniela braga and her now husband adam Friedi and you know, it was really exciting. I took Sound Connection, my one of my bands there, and and we we did a whole thing. And the the part that I was the most anxious about was not any of that. It wasn't pulling off the party and having success. I knew that was going to go. That that was going to be fine. It was if any of my people tested positive and could not leave and come back to the United States. And so it makes me wonder, because we still have that. I mean, some places are relaxing their requirements for that, but there's still plenty where you got to deal with that. And I I was just like, oh, God, please, 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 everyone be negative. Everyone be negative. What are you seeing as far as that aspect of international travel now? Well, I think your feelings of just that anxiety around it is shared by everybody. We did a huge photo shoot in the DR, actually, talking about what a beautiful place that is. And um, we did a photo shoot. There was about seven of us um, that came in from the United States. And most, I think at least three of us had children at home. So that's always a little bit of an extra you know, anxiety, if you have little kids that childcare is an issue or whatever, um, what do you do, right? If you do get stuck, what if you test positive? What if it's a a false positive, you know? So I think when, and we ended up, all of us got back perfectly fine, but there are certain things that I think we all have to really look at and say, you know, is it, is it worth it to, to, because that does happen. And I think what also, what also I've been seeing is, the people that are getting st- stuck, that they're testing positive before they return to the U.S. and so they have, they have to stay in the destination they're in, they are sharing their experiences on social media, and, and which is fine, totally fine. But I think that kind of reinforces that leveling of anxiety because it makes you think, well, oh my gosh, that could happen to me. And so like when I look at travel, it's like, okay, What's like, if I did get stuck, let's pretend I get stuck and I am positive upon my return. 
and I have to stay in the country? Do I have travel insurance? Does my team have travel insurance? So you're able to, you know, if, if the resort you're staying at automatically covers you, great. But they may not cover you for a hospital stay. So you got to make sure you've got medical insurance. Certain destinations did a really good job of, of like totally enforcing this. Costa Rica is one of them. They actually, in order for you to travel to Costa Rica, you have to have travel insurance, which covers your hotel stay. It, it covers a per diem for food. It covers up to $50,000 in uh, medical expenses. And that's also protecting their country. So I think to myself, what's ironic to me, Andy, is the fact that we don't have to test negative, well, depending on the destination. Mexico, for example, you don't have to test negative to go to Mexico. You don't have to test negative to go to the DR. And the DR, I mean, that's that's an island in the Caribbean, you know, like that's that's a very remote destination. And here in the in the United States has more at least, you know, recently we've had more positive cases in the U.S. than anywhere else, almost in the world. And so, but we require a negative test to come here. Like, that's what's so funny to me is it's like, why would we require a negative test when we have infrastructure and all of these things? And we're the ones with the biggest amount of cases. You know, I always, I just always look at that going, I'm sh- kind of shaking my head on that one. Um, but I think, you know, the fear around international travel and getting stuck in the country that you're in, you know, before coming home, that's, that's legitimate because it does happen. But I think if like, for me, when I've done it, I've gone to multiple different international destinations while that requirement was in place where you do have to test negative. And every single time, every single time I had travel insurance, I knew that if I did get stuck, that I had childcare for my children that there wasn't something coming up that I couldn't miss. And I think that's the hard part about a lot of wedding planners, photographers that do nothing but international travel. They may be going from one destination to another. Like they may be going from one destination wedding to another destination wedding a few days later. And so those things like really thinking through, making sure you have backup. (laughs) You know what I mean? No, you're right. It's a logistical (laughs) issue now. It is a logistical issue. More than ever. More Mm -hmm. Than ever. And I do think too that we're going to come out of this. I do think they're going to relax the requirement of testing negative upon your return to the US. I don't think that's going to be something that is a forever deal. It just, it can't be possible. Um, And I do think there are certain destinations that make testing super easy. Uh, There's a lot of different things that you can do that the airlines will accept now where you have like a proxy and you can do it over like a um, you could actually test yourself with different kits over the internet and actually have like a doctor or somebody there with you where they're witnessing you do it. They're witnessing the entire thing. And then that is, that's, you don't even have to like go to a clinic to have it done or have, you know, pay $300 for someone to come to your room to do it. Um, there's just, there's just a lot, there's just so many more resources available. Um, and so anytime someone's like, I'm thinking of doing inter- international travel, I'm like, totally go. But just make sure you're thinking through these these additional things. And you talked about travel protection. Like I've got a destination wedding, again, the music for it in a few weeks in the United States. And I got travel. I made sure we had travel protection for everyone, you know, even here, just in case at the last minute, suddenly someone gets sick. I mean, I I think, again, we seem to be coming out of it, but I I think we all have to have that and build it in. And, you know, you got to think about that. That's that's increased cost for you, right? Well, so every I pass it on to the client. I mean, exactly. Did, and know? that's what I was going to say. So we have to pass that on to the client. You know, that's, that is something when it comes to doing, you know, that your cost of doing business, that's something that is an additional expense that none of us can, we don't really have the luxury of just, you know, putting that in there, another line item, you know, it's good. It is something that clients should probably pay for. Yeah. Well, before we go, Jen, I mean, is there anything else that, um, you know, you'd like to bring up that's relevant to what we've been talking about? You know, to be honest, I'm like going, I hope I don't sound like a Debbie Downer with all of this. I, I do think that we are, hopefully, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball and I never imagined in a million years that we would be two years into this and still talking about it and still like part of our active daily life. 
But I, I do feel like the pendulum is swinging. Maybe it swung a little far in one direction. It'll land where it should. And we're, we will get back to some semblance of normal life soon. <laughs> I don't think it's going to drag on. I don't know that we have the luxury of, of just letting this, you know, completely dominate our lives. I think there's, we're going to have to figure out ways to manage it. And I think every day we get a little closer to that. So, yeah. um, I just would encourage anyone listening, like, you're not alone. It's hard. It's hard. And I think it's good to acknowledge when things are hard, but I also think it's, you know, just being appreciative of the fact that we're still here. If you, even if you lost loved ones through the pandemic or, you know, it's, those things need to be recognized and respected. But I also do think that there's, there's some beauty in the space that we've been given to. Yeah, no, great, great way to end. Well, look, thank you, Jen, for coming on again and talking like this. And I always love having you on and, and, you know, I'm going to continue to do so. And I just appreciate hearing your perspective on this. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Jennifer Stein. You can find her website at DestinationIDo.com and with social media on Facebook at Destination I Do Mag and on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at Destination I Do. And you can check out the blog, DestinationIDo.com forward slash blog. You can find all of this in our show notes at the website of TheWeddingBiz.com. And if you could think of three good friends and colleagues who you feel would benefit from listening to this interview, please forward it to them so that they can check it out and give a top review wherever you get your podcasts from that really helps the show and people find the show. And finally, subscribe to The Wedding Biz, particularly on Instagram at The Wedding Biz, and we'll catch you next week.